Welcome to this edition of Theological Journals, 3.52 p.m., July 9, 2022. An article in Anglican Journal, Welby Pledges Release of School Records. In the end, the survivors agreed that they were only interested in meeting the Archbishop if will it, he was willing to name the church as responsible for perpet perpetrating the harm of the residential schools and to prove his commitment to reconciliation with action. If he's not willing to have these conversations, what is the purpose? This isn't a photo op for the Archbishop, she said. The Anglican Church wanted to reconcile, she added. It was the church, not the survivors, who had to show goodwill. And conditions were away from asserting survivors' control. They're taking their voices back. In his speech at James Smith Cree Nation, Welby did directly state the Anglican Church's responsibility for the schools and the abuse committed there, referring to the survivors' testimony as a window into hell. <clears throat> the difference about that bit of hell is that it was built by the church and in the name of the church, he said, for that terrible crime, sin, evil of deliberately, consciously, stupidly, because evil is stupid, uh, building hell and putting children into it and staffing it. I am more sorry than I could ever, ever begin to express that is both personally and in my role as the Archbishop of Canterbury. While the administrators committing the abuses at the schools were acting in their capacity as representatives of the Anglican Church, well be stressed that the actions were wildly out of step with the gospel. What happened there had nothing to do with Christ. Don Hill, who's a member of Survivor Secretariat and Survivor of the Net Mohawk Institute, which he refers to by the name the Mush Hole, which students gave it for its terrible food. She too tells a story of a contrast between Jesus's teachings and the residential school staff. We were living in an environment of uncaring individuals often there was physical abuse from staff, also sometimes from other kids because no one was watching us, she said. She and one of her sisters were sent to school but were allowed very little contact with one another. One afternoon, Hill says she cried herself to sleep on a bench near the school, grieving her separation from her family. When I fell asleep, I had the most visible dream of Jesus. He was standing on top of the building where the dining room is. He looked down at me and told me he would always look after me. I felt this physical wave went down to my feet of peace, love, and goodness. I've ever had the most overwhelming experience I've ever had in my life. Hill was in her 50s before she spoke about that experience to her sister, who she says was sexually assaulted several times by the minister at Mohawk School. Her question to me was, where in the hell was Jesus when I needed him? Like Wells, Welby Hill notes the gap between what people who call themselves Christian preach and the harm they actually do. I think that is what most people are concerned with today. Not just in the Anglican Church, even the Catholic Church. You've got all this money. What are you actually doing for people? I don't figure I need any help now, but I certainly think about the restoration of language would be really important. After his speech in Toronto, the journal asked Welby what made him commit to getting school records for their survivors. I think that's a promise I can probably keep, and I don't want to promise what I can't do, he replied. He said funding for language programs was not for him to promise, as it was within the jurisdiction of the Anglican Church. And we will pick that up next time as we move to 
Philip Thurston's article on the ancient Israelite calendar. <clears throat> Philo tied Israel's two greatest festivals to the vernal and the autumnal equinocks into the first and seventh month. Exodus 34.22 establishes the observance of Israel's full feast with language that can only be understood in terms of the equidoxal fulcrum of the solar year. Exodus 34.22, Israel is told to celebrate the Feast of Ingathering. Language indicating the equidoxal extremity or turning point of the solar year. The phrase is translated at the year's end, King James Version, Authorized Standard Version, English Standard Version, at the turn of the year, at the revolution of the year, the middle of the year Septuagint. Since one year ends at the same place where another begins, Exodus 12, 2, the King James year's end conveys the correct idea of a turning point. Tekwufat Hasana occurs two times. Syria's army invades Judah at the turning point of the year. It's time of the year when kings go to do battle elsewhere. Toward the return of the year, typically associated with the early spring. When referring to absolute points of the solar year, these two to be, appear to be synonymous terms for turning points. It is probably no coincidence that the two junctures of the solar reference in the Hebrew scripture by Takufot He Shana happen to be 180 degrees removed from one another. Hence, these phrases are not as vague as scholars imagine. This may be then posited as the basis for the Philonic and Rabbinic references to four Tekwafot turning points of the year. The translators of the Septuagint took the reference to the equinox in Exodus 34.22 as the midpoint of the year. Mesuntas, the author of 1 Samuel 2.7, believed the phrase to Kupat Ha Shinema in Exodus 30 42 referred to the fall equinox, which reflects the idea that the sun ruled the year in the festival calendar. The sixth extra month added late summer about 26 times by the Babylonians and Persians dislodges Tishri from its midpoint in the year. Another providing another reason why this means of regulating the year is never seen in ancient Judaism. We turn our attention to Anglican and Episcopal history, the June edition. And the first article is on historiographies of the Lambeth Conference. Writing more than two decades later, Owen Chadwick explained that although the Lambeth Conference was allowed to be founded only if it had no authority, this cut against the grain of social existence because meetings start to gather authority if they exist and are seen not to be a cloud of hot air and rhetoric. This authority, however, was non-juridical because modern church laws took the form of resolutions without legal force in the state. The end result has been the creation by the Lambeth Conference of a non-coercive body of jurisprudence in which concessive conferences appeal to earlier conferences as precedent alongside other normative Christian sources, such as the Bible and the example of the early church. Chadwick concluded that the Lambeth Conference thus remains an indispensable organ of the communion. 
Later discussions of the Lambeth Conference have been equally inclined to dissociate juridical from other forms of authority, special the moral suasion that inheres in Episcopal and pastoral offices. But none of these studies have argued for the abrogation or suspension of the conference. It is a curious fact that alongside an emphasis upon Lambeth Conference's moral authority, there's been a concurrent historiographical drive to treat Longley's denial of synodical authority as if he, as Archbishop, possessed the power to single-handedly determine the constitutional bounds for the Lambeth Conference as an enduring institution. Beginning with this first volume of 1888, Davidson included in his narrative the following statement by Archbishop Longley, which was originally made to the Canterbury Convocation in 1867. Paul Avis, the Lam Lambeth Conference is an instrument of commun communion by Paul Avis, Avis and Mark Chapman. The Oxford Handbook of Anglican Studies, 2015. Quote from Longley, 1867, it has never been contemplated and that we should assume the functions of a general synod of all churches in full communion with the Church of England and take upon ourselves to enact canons that should be binding upon those represented. Davidson, Origins and History of the Lambeth Conferences of 1867 and 1878. We shift now to an article on Paul Ram uh, Michael Ramsey and the Lambeth Conferences. Writing to Ramsey after the Lambeth Conference, UC, Eugene Carson Blake, General Secretary of the World Council of Churches, thought it had a significant effect on the ecumenical scene. One prominent English insider thought that the Anglican Communion had regained the ecumenical initiative because of Lambeth's openness to other Christians because we envisaged the transformation or disappearance of Anglicanism as a separate encampment, not merely as a vague possibility, but as a program for the next 10 years. That openness was both signaled and made manifest by the list who, like Blake, were invited to observe. <clears throat> In 1958, the Lambeth Conference had received delegates from several other churches who had been ceremonially welcomed and had attended the opening services but were not admitted to the main business of the conference. It was very much in line with Ramsey's approach to other churches that the delegates in 1968 were far greater in number and their involvement much closer. The range had been extended beyond Europe and North America and beyond the more familiar denominations to include such bodies as Mar Thoma Church, Society of Friends, and the Assemblies of God. The established free churches in England were represented not individually, but by their worldwide bodies. The Church of South India formed in part of churches that had previously been Anglican, had not been invited to the conferences of 1948 and 58. This time it sent three delegates. Unlike 1958, the observers were able to attend and speak in plenary sessions of the conference and if invited to attend meetings of the subcommittees. They have not come to just watch, said Ramsey in a televised interview. They've come to take part in the discussions and giving and taking. I think their presence will make us a bit more of an ecumenical conference. 
to observers themselves, he said, you are here so generously because we need you. We'll break that up again as we turn to international relations. The encyclical released from Lambeth in 1920 observed that people had discovered their need for fellowship with a new intensity in the contexts of industrial life and international war. It was now the great object of the Christian church to call people to the contemplation of God and reconciliation with one another. To do this, the church must itself present a pattern of fellowship. In this sense, the appeal to all Christian people, which became the most famous achievement of Lambeth Conference 1920, was consistent with the vision of peace which preceded it. The encyclical pronounced, we commend to all Christian people the principles that underlie the League of Nations, the most promising and most systematic attempt to advance towards the ideal of family of nations which has ever been projected. The interval, 1920 to 29. In the 1920s, Anglicans at large became not merely observers of the new age of diplomatic diplomacy, but for vigorous participants in it. Much of this activity was ecumenical in character. In Birmingham in 1924, there had taken a place the Conference on Christian Politics, Economics, and Citizenship, a boldly ambitious venture in view of the 12 diverse reports were discussed, one of them devoted to international relations and another to Christianity and war. Meanwhile, the development of the international ecumenical movement could be traced through a succession of conferences which bore a resemblance to the conferences of the new diplomacy. In particular, the World Conference of Life and Work in Stockholm in 1925 initiated a decisive continuing narrative creating new forms and patterns of international association, study, and discussion. The Stockholm Conference issued a statement which at once considered important. We believe that war, considered as an institution for the settlement of international disputes, is incompatible with the mind and method of Christ. Busily at work in all of this was George Bell, who is now Dean of Canterbury. We pick up with the discussion. The uh, leaked draft of the Supreme Court article on Roe v. Wade. Let's ask why. Why and by whom was the draft opinion leaked now? It is our pressure upon the justices and how they will vote in June. Or with midterm elections coming up, was it to take the American public's attention away from such issues as inflation, the border, unemployment, and instead to rise, rile up the voters against any perceived threat to the freedom to kill unborn babies? What does all this have to do with us as believers and the church? No, the church as an institution does not get involved in politics. Her only calling is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. But as individual believers, we are by God's providence, citizens of a state and country. Our calling in scripture is to pray for those in authority that they might rule righteously and through their rule we as believers in church can live peacefully and have the freedom to carry out our calling. Have you and will you be praying for our Supreme Court justices that they will rule truly and rightly? 
as citizens, we have the privilege to have a say in what takes place in our country and states. How important is it for believers to vote for president, governors, representatives, and senators? It was President Trump who, when running for the White House in 2016, campaigned with the promise that if elected, he would appoint Supreme Court justices who would overthrow Wall Row. He kept his promise that is quite different from our current president. If Roe v. Wade is overturned, the Democrats will seek to get a bill signed in the House and Senate. They would need 60 votes, which they do not have now. Do you think that the votes of Christians are important in elections? Governors and states are vowing that they will make sure that women in their states have the freedom to abortion. We as believers are thankful knowing that God is on the throne in heaven. While the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, He, he that sitteth in heaven shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. God rules with his son, Jesus, sitting on the throne. We as believers are responsible in our calling as citizens. God in his providence is pleased to use people in their positions to do his will. Whether it was a Joseph as the second highest ruler in Egypt, or Daniel with the kings of Babylon and Persian, or even an unbelieving Esther or Cyrus to carry out his will and purposes for his people. And he is pleased to use each and every one of his chosen people in their own place and calling. But God says in Psalm 2, Yet I have set my king upon the holy hill of Zion. Ask of me, and I shall give the heathen for thine inheritance. Senate 2022 of the CRC Committee to Articulate the Foundation Laying Biblical Theology of Human Sexuality. This material is gleaned from a report by Allison Vernon, new editor of the banner. One of the items to appear before the Synod of Christian Reformed Church this year is the report of the Committee to Articulate the Foundation Laying Biblical Theology of Human Sexuality. This was a committee mandated by Synod 2016. The report was to report in 20, 2021, but because there was no Senate last year due to COVID, it is now before Senate 2022. This report is being followed closely by the CRC churches because of homosexuals and lesbians and same-sex marriages in their churches some of them even allowed to hold special offices in the church. Reactions are flowing in from various classes, regional groups of churches. Nine classes are sending communications supporting the Human Sexuality Report. Classes BC Northwest further asks for another study committee to provide in-depth pastoral guidelines for implementation of the report. Classes Wisconsin asks Synod to admonish and, if necessary, discipline church office bearers and assemblies that have acted and taught contrary to the official teaching of the CRCNA without going through the process of submitting all overtures or gravamina. Classes Rocky Mountain is sending a communication and a request that question the report's thoroughness and ask Senate not to accept it. Classes B C Northwest asks the Senate not 
to accede to the recommendation that Synod declare that the church's teaching on premarital sex, extramarital sex, adultery, polyamory, pornography, and homosexual sex already has confessional status. Classes California asks Synod to correct an apparent contradiction involving cohabitation. Is it sinful and condemned because of its association with premarital sex, or as it is proposed as a possibility for same-sex attracted people? Classes Southeast asks for a revision of the CRC's position on homosexuality. In 1973, the CRC made a distinction between a homosexual and the acting out of it. The inward desire is not sin, only the acting out of it. We turn our attention to table talk. The main themes of scripture by Reverend John P. Rhodes, Minister of Christ Church Central Leeds in Leeds, England, author of several books. The main themes of scripture, how do you get from London to Edinburgh? Even if you've visited either city, you'll likely know there's more than one answer to the question. Plug the dish destinations into a maps program and you'll be offered a variety of routes and even those will be just major ones. In reality there are thousands of connections between the two capitals an almost endless number of ways you can travel between them. Of course some are more obvious than others large motorways cutting a clearer trail than the winding country roads, but the question, the point is the same. There are many ways to make the journey. When it comes to scripture, what links Genesis to Revelation? We know the Bible is one book, giving a coherent, unified message. It is ultimately the product of one author, revealing the one way of salvation to mankind. But if there's only one theme that binds the Bible together, the answer surely is no. Just as on any other journey, there are multiple paths we might follow to trace God's great redemption story. To change the image, Scripture is a book woven together by many threads, a rope of many intertwining cords. To search for the one theme of the Bible is a pointless exercise. Rather we, rather, we can enjoy discovering dozens, perhaps hundreds, of different melodies that combine to create the final symphony. Let's consider some of the major roads. It's sometimes noted that the Bible nowhere uses the common evangelical phrase, relationship with God. This is not, of course, because there is no relationship with God. The Bible word for that bound between Jesus and his people is covenant. Unsurprisingly, therefore, covenant is a major road through the pages of Scripture. Beginning in the Garden of Eden, God entered into a covenant with Adam. Although the explicit word covenant doesn't appear in the text of Genesis 2, all the elements that make up a covenant are there, two parties, God and Adam, terms of the relationship, wholehearted obedience expressed in the command not to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, penalties if the covenant is breached, death, and rewards if it is kept eternal life, symbolized by the tree of life, Genesis 3.22. Indeed, as Hosea later refers to this arrangement as a covenant, Hosea 6.7. Once Adam breaks this covenant of works, as it has most been commonly known, God doesn't abandon the idea of covenant. 
instead he continues to bind himself to people through covenant, this time not of works but of grace. Abram receives incredible promises and enters into one such covenantal union with God, Genesis 5, 15, 17. But Abraham is not called to perfect obedience as the terms of this covenant. Rather, he believed the Lord, and it was counted to him for righteousness. In time, Abram's family grew and ended up in slavery in Egypt. But God remembered his covenant with Abraham and called, came to the rescue. As a result of this rescue, he refreshed and expanded his covenant with Israel this time at Sinai. The same promises that were made to Abraham were reissued, land, descendants, protection. Together with the covenant promise, I will be your God and you will be my people. Fast forward several hundred years and David and his descendants are added to the covenant story. From now on, he and his offspring will rule God's people. And eventually we come to the new covenant. Jesus inaugurated this with his death, resurrection, and ascension. Pouring out his spirit at Pentecost, Mark 14, 24. But the shape remains as it has always been. God's people trust his gospel promises and he blesses them out of sheer grace. The promise of a land is expanded to include the new heavens and the new earth. The largely ethnic Jewish people of the Old Testament grows to include those from all nations. But fundamentally, the work of Jesus in the new covenant is Zechariah. As Zechariah sings, because God has come to show his mercy and promises to our fathers. We might consider the theme of God's presence with his people. In the garden in Eden, God met with Adam and Eve, walking in the cool of the day. The fall led to man's expulsion from the blessed, God's blessed presence, with the guard, garden guarded by cherubim wielding a fiery servant. God promised to be with Abraham, and there were occasional theophanies theophanies, appearances of God throughout Genesis and Exodus. Think of Abraham's mysterious visitors in Genesis 18 or the burning bush in Exodus 3. But as with the building of the tabernacle, the portable dwelling place of God, we get the next great step forward. At the close of Exodus, fire falls on the most holy place, the perfectly cubic center of the tabernacle, the throne room of God. Yahweh is back with his people, though distanced through the protective zones of the tent. This tabernacle is in fact reminiscent of Eden. The entrance is to the east, as was the garden's entrance. Cherubim are sewn into the curtain guarding the entrance. Candlesticks are shaped like trees. The garden theme continues with the building of the permanent temple under King Solomon. Now the Israelites have a homeland in capital city. David's son builds a permanent home for God. And again, fire falls as Yahweh moves. 2 Chronicles 7. God is present with his people right through the dramatic visions in of Ezekiel, in which the prophet sees the glory of the Lord depart. Coupled with the destruction of the temple, it would seem that God had left his people. Hence the incredible opening of John's Gospel, where we read the word became flesh and tabernacled amongst us. God has returned to dwell on earth, and in Jesus, he himself is the true temple. 
As his body is broken and then raised, he ascends to pour out his spirit on the church and thus can promise them that when he will be with them to the very end of the age. Between Christ's first and second comings, God is present with his people in a way that means both the individual believer and church can be described as temples of the Holy Ghost. Finally, on the day of Jesus' return, the dwelling place of God will be with man as heavens and earth are reunited. Indeed, the new Jerusalem is described as a perfect cube to symbolize it to the whole new earth as it has become a most holy place as God lives with his people. Covenant and God's presence are just two major roads through the Bible. We could have traced the theme of God's people from Adam and Eve and Eden through the godly line of Seth the family of Abraham, the Israelites at Sinai, down to the multi multinational church of our own age. We might consider the kingdom of God. Adam was given dominion over all the creation, but lost his throne as he submitted to Satan's word. Israel as a nation was a kingdom of priests but failed to exercise its duties well. David, who with his descendants had the privilege of being called sons of David, has at best a mixed blessing to God's people. And the kingdom of Israel was divided and conquered and in large part destroyed under his successors. But with the resurrection of Jesus, we finally meet a king who's been given all authority and can therefore rule over a kingdom that knows no end. For now the kingdom is found in the church, Matthew 16, 18 through 19, though one day it will encompass a whole new creation. So scripture is bound together by myriad intertwining themes. Pulling on even a minor thread can prove fruitful. Think of the thorns we meet for the first time as part of the curse that we find ultimately woven into the crown adorning Messiah's brow as he bears the curse for his people. Similarly, the fall leads to sweat. Work has become unpleasant and tiring, forcing life to ooze out of us. What a relief, therefore, to see that Jesus sweats blood for us in the Garden of Gethsemane, a reminder that the work of our salvation lies in his hands alone as he pours his life out for his people. Very nice article. Turn to August's table talk on misunderstood biblical, but misunderstood biblical words, the horn of salvation. Give me a second here. Let me pull up a bookmarker. We have an article here by Dr. Clayton Williams, Professor of Old Testament Studies at Reform Presbyterian Theological Seminary in Pittsburgh. Horn of Salvation. God has raised up a horn of salvation for us. Luke 1, 69. Thus the imminent birth of Christ was announced by Zechariah, the elderly priest and father of John the Baptist. But how did his symbolism of a horn shed light on the advent of Christ and his work? What is the wellspring of this imagery? And what does it teach us about God and our salvation? David praised God as a horn of salvation in Psalm 18.2. And Christ had long been anticipated as the horn who would be raised up. 1 Samuel 2.10, Psalm 132.17. 
Many see the image of a horn as picturing the strength and dominance of a powerful animal, meant to symbolize the efficacy of God's work through Christ. A horn can also be seen as an image of exaltation. The lifting up of the horn depicts the victory of God's grace and the exaltation of his people. While this symbolism of strength and exaltation is undoubtedly biblical, it does not fully explain how a horn is an image of salvation itself as accomplished by a savior who came as a docile lamb rather than a mighty stag. <clears throat> the word translated horn is predominantly used in the Old Testament to refer not to animals, but to altars in the tabernacle and temple. For example, horns are a distinctive feature of the altar of incense. These horns likely took the shape of upward projections at the four corners of the altar. God commanded that the high priest should make atonement on its horns once a year, which took place on the Day of Atonement, when the blood of a bull and goat was put on the horn, horns of the altar all around. Likewise, the sin offering called the blood of the bull to be put on the horns of the altar with the blood of bulls and goats that symbolized atonement. But it was on the horns of the altar that blood atonement was symbolized. In the priestly service and worshiping of Israel, the altar horns were indelibly associated with the provision of atonement through the shedding of blood. They held no small place in the ritual symbolism of God's forgiveness that would be fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Perhaps this connection between the altar's horns and the atonement for sin is why several characters in the Old Testament, when fearing that they might be killed, or took hold of the horns of the altar to do this was to plead for mercy. Given this background, the association of horns with the provision of atonement would have been a natural one for Zechariah the priest. Thus it seems significant that Gabriel appeared to Zechariah. The angel was standing at the altar of incense, right next to those horns, where the work of Christ had been symbolized for many centuries, Luke 111. Zechariah was mute for a time after his encounter, but when his tongue was finally loosed, he prophesied the birth of Christ and called him a horn of salvation for us. On this horn, the blood of atonement would be shed once and for all and for us. The blood sprinkled on the horns of the altar year after year could not accomplish the salvation that it symbolized. Hebrews 10, 1 to 4. Every element of the earthly sanctuary anticipated and force signified the coming of Christ, the great high priest, whose self-sacrifice would atone for his people's sin decisively and forever. Now we can rejoice and give thanks that a horn of salvation has been raised up for us in the place of the horns of the ancient altar. The horn was bloodied only once, but with the only blood that is able to cleanse us from all sins, 1 John 1, 7. Taking hold of the horns of the altar may have been an ancient way to plead for mercy, but it was no guarantee. Adonijah and jo Joab both did so and still suffered the recompense for their sins. 1 Kings 1, 2.25 If God provided all his people with a true and eternal horn of salvation in Jesus Christ, 
to take hold of him alone, by faith alone, is to find peace with God and the forgiveness of sins. And the next article we have is The Kinsman Redeemer by Quentin Palerna. Quentin, Dr. Falkenna, I should say, is pastor of Cornerstone Christian Church in Medford, Oregon. Kinsman Redeemer, another difficult biblical word. Talked about horn, now Kinsman Redeemer. Pawn shops, foreclosures, and bankruptcy highlight the reality of financial crisis that people experience in our day. Have you ever needed financial assistance? Maybe you have asked a family member to help pay your credit card bill, student loan, or mortgage payment. Or maybe a family member has asked you to help pay off debt. We'll just make a start here. The need for financial help is a useful way to introduce the idea of a kinsman redeemer. In short, a kinsman redeemer is a relative who, at his own expense, pays off the debts of another. But this theme points to beyond finances, because our greatest need is not for someone to pay off our financial debts, however great that need may be but for someone to redeem us from our debt of sins that we have incurred. This will go well with Shirley Baker of Princeton Theological Journal 2007 on the atonement. She will choke here like a dog on a bone. We don't overstate it. She's an Abelardian who hates God's justice, holiness, and righteousness. This is how the Old Testament idea of a kinsman redeemer bears on our understanding of the redemption through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. The idea of a kinsman redeemer is laid out in the Levitical laws, displayed by men such as Boaz and Jeremiah, fulfilled by Jesus who paid for our sins with his precious blood. We'll continue that in our next sitting. We turn to Bibliotheca Sacra and a bit of a wonky article on chronology of the life of Christ with emphasis on the nativity and epiphany. Talking about these different deities, that the pagan deity with connections to Dionysius was given a virgin birth makes possible that the shared date of January 6th in church tradition, together with the virgin birth of Christ, caused or enabled hostile parties to associate Christianity with Dionysius and Bacchus and gave rise to the calumny that Christians engaged in sordid sexual crimes in their assemblies, therefore they should be proscribed. A footnote here, Christians were accused of killing and eating infants and of committing incest with their brothers, sisters, and mothers in secret orgies. Tertullian specifically mentions Bacchanalianism among the chief accusations leveled against Christians in justification for their persecution. Quote, yet... The very tradition of your fathers with which you seem to faithfully defend and in which you find your principal matter of accusation against the Christians, I mean zeal in the worship of the gods, the point in which antiquity has mainly heard, although you have rebuilt the altars of Serapis, now a Roman deity, and Bacchus, now become a god of Italy. You offer up your orgies, Tertullian's apology. Apology means defense. Indeed, it may be the suppression of the Bacchanalian cult reported by Livy provided the legal precedent for imperial persecution of the church, beginning with Nero. 
footnote 26, the proscription of the Roman Senate forbidding anyone to sell or buy anything for the purpose of flight is remarkably similar to John's description revelation that none might buy or sell save he had the number of the beast. So we must wonder if this is not a deliberate illusion. Prior to Nero, Christianity was protected by religio licita, which guaranteed peoples of the empire to the right to worship according to their ancestral customs. Got a note here by Josephus. Although the emperor sometimes suppressed astrologers and soothsayers. Oh, hi, Mary. I didn't see you come in. Good to see you. Who cursed disturbances by feigned predictions of alterations in the government. It was the general policy to allow the people of the provinces to maintain their traditional religious observances until they became disruptive or subversive. Claudius, in particular, maintained the Pax Romana by enforcing the religio licita. Josephus records the edict of Claudia protecting religious observance. All men should be so subject to the Romans as to continue the observation of their own customs and not be forced to transgress the ancient rules of their own home country. Josephus's Antiquities. For Christianity to lose this protection would have required a great legal precedent, which may have been found in Livy. Tacitus indicates that Nero persecuted Christians to shift blame from himself for the burning of Rome in AD 64. We'll pick this up again. A nice little article. Turning to modern Reformation, the May-June issue. And, uh, we will conclude this article here today on Restoring Eve by Kendra Dahl, in which she has exegeted Genesis 3.16 very carefully and very well with some thirty footnotes. My hope in re-examining this passage is not to impose different culturally informed biases into the text, but rather to bring us back to the biblical text, Genesis 3, 15, 16, to see the role of these Genesis chapters in not only shaping our views of men and women, but shaping in shaping the understanding of God's covenant dealings with his people and his plan for the redemption of fallen image bearers. Certainly the creation account speaks to God's creation of male and female, a reality that is under attack in our time and place. But in an attempt to counteract the secular cultural views on sex and gender, have we unwittingly read into scripture views of the same that aren't there? I'm persuaded that the creation account establishes male headship that carries through to the church and home today. And then Kendra has an MA from Westminster, California, Director of Content for Core Christianity and White Horse Inn. A principle that has largely been discarded outside of complementarian circles and practiced poorly within them. But if Genesis 3.16 rests on the narrative that God highlights God's grace and mercy, rather than establishing gender-based suspicion of one another, and perhaps our conversations about men and women could shift away from concerns about power and control to love, service, partnership, and responsibility. 
perhaps we could lay down our arms in the battle of the sexes and tell the truth about our sinful inclinations without having to assign them to a particular sex, just as God restored Eve to her rightful place, Adam's side, allowing for rent, life and redemption to continue. Perhaps we could restore the daughters of Eve within the church, recognizing them not as threats, but as partners in the gospel kind of thought we were already along in that road. And now we are in Modern Reformation, July and August, and it's an interview with Dr. Ryan Putnam, Putnam on his book, Doctrine Divides. Tradition, as your question, is a bit of a buzzword in many evangelical circles today you write positively of tradition that can help readers find their footing in scripture page 153 you also state as a matter of fact tradition cannot be escaped we cannot theologize outside of some tradition of belief and practice page 154 Yet you also warn that tradition can distort our ability to understand the authorial intent of scripture. How should we think about the role of tradition in our own theological development? Here's his answer. Tradition is another one of those words that can be used in many different senses. In the broadest sense of the term, tradition describes any belief custom or practice handed over from one individual to another or one group to another. Anything learned, taught, or passed along fits in this category. Rituals, histories, folk tales, recipes, songs, and so on. Though its divine inspiration clearly sets it apart as a truly unique assortment of writings. The Bible itself is a part of tradition in this broader sense, as it is a collection of teachings, histories, laws, songs, handed down by Israel and later by the church. Paul, for example, encourages the church at Corinth to hold fast to the traditions instituted by Christ, 1 Corinthians 11.2, and notes that he passed along the same gospel tradition he had received, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3. Christian theologians also use tradition with a capital T to describe the interpretation of scripture throughout history. This is the faith once delivered over to the saints believed everywhere and by all, everyone, everywhere, use the Laurentian canon. Historical theology is a history of biblical interpretation in this sense. Another use of tradition with a lowercase t describes the particular faith traditions from which we think about and practice the Christian faith. Baptist Presbyterian, Wesleyan. This is just a reminder that we always do theology in a church context. This is tradition, while not infallible, can give us wise insights into the historic interpretation and application of biblical texts. What I warn about in the book is tradition unchecked which often comes in the form of confirmation bias. Our theological tradition informs us that we should believe a certain way. And sometimes our approach to scripture is simply the search for verses or texts that confirm our deeply held belief. We also ignore, rationalize, or de-emphasize texts that are problematic for our theological tradition. I have seen 
a student's Bible where all the verses that contradicted his belief of his church were marked through with a pen. This kind of bias is not limited to conservative traditions. I've read liberal scholars who say we must dismiss Pauline passages about women or homosexuality as something from a bygone patriarchal society. Anything that does not confirm our theological biases must be reinterpreted or rejected. We all come to faith within a tradition. We are all discipled in a tradition. But my plea is to give scriptural primacy, to place ourselves under the lordship of Christ expressed in the text. We shouldn't feel obligated to make square pegs fit into round holes, nor should we feel that we have to pit our beliefs against what the text says or means. There are ways of alleviating this kind of bias, like reading broadly across several lower case traditions, asking what kind of evidence we look for in scripture if our preferred doctrinal tenet is wrong and considering other hypotheses tradition. Now for Gerard Cesar and the discussion of the Beatitudes and the life of Christ. He's talking here about blessed are the lowly and meek. Turner helps to set purity of heart in the broader context of the gospel. Footnote, this is from Turner's commentary on Matthew. We're talking about the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew presents certain Pharisees as modeling an external rule-oriented purity that Jesus rejects because it masks inner corruption. His disciples are to be characterized by inner piety and purity that flow from single-minded devotion to God and surpass mere externally accepted behavior. The power of God's reign, inaugurated by Jesus, purifies from the inside out. And so the disciples must cultivate integrity in their private and public lives. And he's got several references here. The Pharisees of Matthew's Gospel had allowed a focus on ritual purity of hands to prevent them from doing just deeds that proceed from a pure heart. They were not focused on innocent hands, but on hands that had been ceremonially washed. For the psalmist's clean hands were a metaphor for deeds that grew out of a pure heart. The Pharisees addressed by Jesus, it seems that clean hands in the literal sense were essential to having a heart that was pure. Therefore, hand washing rather than just deeds flowing from a pure heart came their obsession. The Pharisees misplaced focus on clean hands rather than a clean heart is expounded in Matthew 15. There, after the Pharisees confronted Jesus regarding his disciples eating with unwashed hands, not a problem with the law, but a problem with the written and oral tradition, Jesus demonstrates how the Pharisees had masked their greed with a veneer of piety. I've dedicated that to God, 1515, in order to keep them from having to honor their parents. Honoring parents came from the second table of the law, love of neighbor. We'll pick that up again as we shift to Westminster Theological Journal and the continuing article by Tory Trier on Third Article Theology. He seems to have been giving it his thumbs up. Consequently, in Clouch's words, habits, this habits advocates a 10-point 
resume for third article theology. Habits espouses a reciprocal model of double movement in which the Son is eternally generated from the Father. This is a discussion of the Trinity. And in and by the Spirit, and the Son loves the Father in and by the Spirit. In brief, per habits, H-A-B-E-T-S. In the immanent trinity, the Father begets the Son in or by the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit simultaneously proceeds from the Father as the one in whom the Son is begotten. This is really some wonky stuff. The Father, too, is simultaneously personed in the begetting of the Son in the Spirit and the spiration of the Spirit through the Son, close quote. This reconception of intra-Trinitarian relations and the consequent emphasis on the Spirit's active role therein is not arbitrarily concocted. Clanch notes, assuming the validity of the first half of Rahner's rule, the economic trinity is the immanent trinity. Habit rule reasons from scripture that the personal hypostatic identity of the son must be in some way dependent upon the personal hypostatic identity with the spirit. The biblical text upon which habits draws is the virginal conception of Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is directly responsible for bringing about Jesus' conception and is linked to his identification of Jesus as the Son of God. Habit concludes the eternal hypostatic identity of the Son is to be understood in terms of working of the Spirit by whom the Father generates the Son. Thus, in summary form, is Habit's vision of spirit Christology. I now turn to address the deficiencies of Habit's spirit Christology, again following the work of Kyle Clouch, either by agreement or by independent determination. First, it is incoherent to posit the hypostatic identity of the Holy Spirit upon two distinct eternal moments of spiration. Number one, from the Father to the Son. Two, from the Son to the Father. This formulation would seem to make the Spirit logically prior to the Son in the order of divine being, which disrupts the traditional Trinitarian taxonomy. Habits may f find such reordering acceptable. I do not for reasons I articulate below. Second, Habit's reciprocal model of intra-Trinitarian relation disrupts the revelatory correspondence between God's being and doing. Correspondence that the tr traditional ta taxes, generation, inspiration actu accurately captures only in a theological journal like Westminster. We turn to Mid-American Theological Journal by Dr. Cornelius Venema discussing Reformed theology's views on effectual calling and regeneration. He's been working summarizing Turkey heretofore. After his Turton's exposition on the nature of the gospel call, including the distinction between internal and external calling, Turton offers an extended account of the seriousness and sincerity of the gospel call when it is addressed indiscriminately to all sinners. He then turns to the subject of effectual calling and offers an extended exploration of what accounts for its efficacy. In this discussion, Turton provides a theological and biblical case for distinguishing between regeneration in its narrower and broader senses. 
when Turretin offers his more extensive account of effectual calling, he begins with a summary of the position he wishes to expound and then offers five propositions to elaborate upon the nature and reason for the efficacy of the gospel call in drawing the elect into fellowship with Christ. In summary, it is as follows. The Orthodox suspend the calling of efficacy of the calling neither upon the event nor its congruity, but they drive it from the supernatural power of grace and the divine and ineffable motion to God, which so sweetly and at the same time powerfully affects the man that he cannot help following God who calls and being converted, although its nature cannot be indeed fully perceived by us we embrace it in five propositions. When Turretin states that the efficacy of calling does not depend upon the event, he means to refer to the ministry of the gospel in the sense of the external or general proclamation to all lost sinners. When the gospel is proclaimed, it is not always accompanied by the powerful working of God's spirit whereby lost sinners are converted. Simply stated, not all lost sinners are called effectually according to God's purpose of election. When Turton also rejects the notion that the gospel is efficacious by congruity, he then refers to the opinion of Roman Catholic theologian Bellarmin and others like Suarez and Molina, the Jesuit, who taught that the gospel call is a form of moral suasion that becomes efficacious through the fit, free, independent acts of those whom God foreknows will be disposed to cooperate with it at a suitable time and within his providential ordering of events. We see the similarity there to Arminianism, evangelical Arminianism, maybe even Lutheranism. In Turretin's judgment, the doctrine of congruity betrays a semi-Pelagian or Arminian standpoint, we agree. The efficacy of the gospel call finally depends upon a free, indeterminate act on the part of those to whom the call is extended. The doctrine of congruity shares with the semi-Pelagian and Arminian teaching the idea of synergy between God's grace and the sinner's free will in cooperating with and thereby rendering it efficacious. The first of Turton's five propositions on the efficacy of the calling is a restatement of his last part of the summary, where he admits its nature cannot indeed be fully perceived by us. As he states it in propositional form, the Lord in grace as well as nature is inscrutable. By granting the proposition in the first place, Turton wants to affirm a common theme present in 16th and 17th century discussions of the topic. Just as the authors of the Canon of Dort emphasize the mysterious and ineffable manner in which the Spirit of Christ works with the Word in calling the elect to salvation, Turretin emphasizes that even his careful elucidation of the topic does not adequately comprehend the way God works in effectual calling. When it comes to the work of the Spirit in effectual calling, we must never forget the point that our Lord makes John 3 regarding the way of the Spirit's working. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Contrary to a common prejudice that his careful scholastic theological formations 
are a regrettable form of hair splitting or overweening logic. Turretin expressly acknowledges that his endeavor to understand does not deny the incomprehensibility of God and his works. Pick that up again as we turn to Global Anglicanism, an article by Rich Duncan on the dangers of Biblicism in talking about Socinians. Mortimer has argued that a tendency toward rationalism blossomed in monarchist circles during and after the civil wars in reaction to the perceived excesses of radical religion. This may have made Biddle's syllogistic reasoning in 12 Arguments, 1647, timely, since his use of the biblical text involved in Capic's eyes, forcing it through an unforgiving rationalist grid. Biddle was following the approach of the Rakovian Catechism, which had dismissed the concept of eternal generation as incoherent on the basis that if the Father's essence is communicated to the Father, it must be divided, and if all of the essence is communicated, it must be lost. Therefore, instead of being used as an interpretive tool, Reason was routinely placed about scripture in the hermeneutical pecking order. Carl Truman has demonstrated how, in response, John Owen foregrounded his methodological priority of revelation over reason by arguing that whatever God has revealed must necessarily be possible. Therefore, continues Truman, it is the Socinians, not Owen, operating on the basis of a ra rational a priori's at this point. In this way, per Capic, the Socinians attempted to employ the Renaissance emphasis on rationalism with the Reformation's emphasis on freedom, promoting the application of critical human faculties to religious texts Although it would be anachronistic to identify this propensity with the 18th century rationalist movement, capital R, Socinianism was in part its foreshadowing, allowing commentators such as Herman Bovink and Louis Burkhoff to apply to Biddle the epithet rationalist, small r. In summary, we find Socinian methodology a combination of thoroughgoing Biblicism with an unflinching rationalism. Indeed, far from being a contradiction in terms, we've seen that the Biblicist element of this approach was in fact underpinned by its rationalism. It's time as we shift to Fundamentals in the Faith, an article by Cannon. Dyson Hag dealing with the dissectionists is what is what I call the Graffel Hausians. And he quotes here a lovely little uh, citation from this, uh, professor of Assyriology at Oxford, Sace against the Graffies. Is there nothing in the splitting theories, he says, in summarizing a long line of defense of the unity of the book of Isaiah? Is there not, nothing, is there then nothing in the splitting theories? To my mind, nothing at all. Lines of defense, page 136. Green and Bissell are as able, if not abler, scholars than Robertson Smith and Professor Briggs. And both of these men, as a result of the widest and deepest research, have come to the conclusion that the theories of the Germans are unscientific, unhistorical, 
and unscholarly. We would agree they were not deeply read at all in ancient Near Eastern scribal practices. This should be shouted from the rooftops. The last words of Professor Green in his very able work on higher criticism of the Pentateuch are most suggestive. Quote, would it not be wiser for them to revise their own ill-judged alliance with the enemies of evangelical truth and inquire whether Christ's view of the Old Testament may not, after all, be the true view? Yes, that, after all, is a great and final question. We trust we are not ignorant. We feel sure that we are not malignant. We desire to treat no man unfairly or set anything down in malice. But we here stand with Christ and his church. If we have any prejudice, we would rather be prejudiced against rationalism. If we have any bias, it must be against the teaching which unsteadies heart, hearts and unsettles faith, the faith of believers. Even at the expense of being thought behind the times, we prefer to stand with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in receiving the scriptures as the word of God without objection and without doubt. A little learning and a little listening to rationalistic theorizers and sympathizers may incline us to uncertainty, but deeper study and deeper research will incline us, as it did Hengstenberg and Moeller, to the profoundest conviction of the authority and the authenticity of the Holy Scriptures, and to cry, Thy word is very pure, and therefore thy servant loveth it. And that is the end of that article. We'll pick up the next time with the Mosaic authorship of the Pentateuch by Professor George Frederick Wright of Oberlin College. We turn now to our next article with Dr. Michael <coughs> Reeves. He's reviewing theologians you should know. He's still in the post-apostolic period talking about Justin Martyr's writings. His first apology, and the word apology, apolo, apologia, means defense. Justin's first apology, or first defense, was written around 153, 154. As an open letter to Emperor Antoninus Pius and his two adopted sons, who succeed him, Marcus Aurelius and Lucius Verus. All three were renowned as keen philosophers and just rulers, and it is to these traits that Justin appeals. The Apologia, or the Apology, or the Defense, opens with a plea for Christians to be judged on the basis of evidence, and for charges against them to be investigated before judgment was passed. Clearly, the reality on the ground was that Christians were being punished on the basis of unsubstantiated rumors, the three main forms of which Justin goes on to counter. First, he asserts that Christians are not atheists, as alleged, for they worship the Father, Son, and Spirit. Second, Christians are not immoral but are all prepared to stand trial for their conduct. Third, they are not seditious. The kingdom they seek belong, does not belong to this world. Rather, they are loyal citizens paying their taxes. Having thus dealt with the common charges against Christianity, Justin then goes on to show the positive value of Christianity. It is unreasonable to dismiss Christian beliefs, he argues, for they are most reasonable. Many Christian beliefs, he suggests, share similarities with features of paganism that Romans happily accepted 
the Romans believed in an afterlife, in deification, or at least for Caesar, and in virgin birth. The Greek god Perseus supposedly was born of a virgin. I've got a footnote here. It's common for theologians of the early post-apostolic church to speak of deification as a key aspect of Christian salvation. Quite different things could be meant by it. The theologians of the second century though, deification was normally seen as being roughly synonymous with adoption. That is through the spirit, Christ are made sons of the most high and the firstborn son confer just the martyr dialogue with Trifo. In this way, Christians can be said to enter the eternal fellowship of the Father. The difference is Christians have complete, concrete, historical reasons for their belief, whereas pagans have nothing better than unsubstantiated fables. We'll pick up Justin Martyr's defense later as we turn to this baffle gathering by this hater of Christ's atonement, Cheryl Baker in Princeton Theological Journal. No need for Christ in the atonement, no need for the cross, other than a nice example of dying for nothing, other than to provide us an example. For Abelard, forgiveness wins a person over through the love inherent in the act. And by eliciting the good that resides in one who expects retribution but receives mercy instead. Forgiveness calls to the offender with love. She's got law with no penalty. Holiness with no law. Righteousness with no law. Summoning him or her to take responsibility for the offense. So she just reinserts law here. To give up the self-involvement and to repent of the offense. Mool states that in such a case, forgiveness is ruthless in the severity of its judgment. Although judgment in its deepest sense is never a destructive condemnation. I wonder what God meant in Genesis 3 or what he means in Isaiah 13 to 23, but it's essentially reconciling. Repentance produced by forgiveness harmonizes the strange parties in the bond of divine love. Human sin incurred an unimaginable debt to God, a horrific and unfathomable ch chasm between God and creation so that we have no relationship with God. Nonetheless, as God forgives, God reaches out and embraces all of us, even the worst of us. Such boundless love and unexpected forgiveness in the face of our own sin and guilt reveals as in a mirror the deformity of our own guilt, becoming our own judge, expecting retribution, and receiving love in its place enables us to realize the extent of our sin. Consequently, we repent so that reconciliation and creation of a new relationship can take place between God and those who repent. If God forgives before we repent, before we admit our offense, why did Jesus suffer and die on the cross? If the passion did not take place in order to satisfy God in a violent economy of exchange necessary forgiveness, why the cross? What relevance does the passion of Jesus hold for us today? That's what we've been asking as she's taken off tearing into the atonement. Timothy Geringe offers this explanation concerning the Passion event. The necessity of the death of Jesus may have less to do with providence 
and with the fate of anyone who critiques the ruling powers. John the Baptist, with whom Jesus was compared, had been executed, and Jesus must have seen the writing on the wall. We'll pick this up again as that all-important question is hanging and she's not answering it. Turn to Reform Faith and Practice and it's Dr. Fesco's argument on your heart is Voss, the earlier Voss and the later Voss. And he's going to try to explain how those two views cohere in the same man. Now he's turning to the history of interpretation on Romans 1, 3, and 4, Augustine. Augustine's unfinished commentary on Romans was one of the earliest works to explain Romans 1, 3 to 4 along vertical lines. He writes, it was necessary to meet those who in their impiety only accept our Lord Jesus Christ in their humanity assumed by him but who do not recognize his divinity, which distinguishes and separates him from all creation. The word, the eternal Son of God, became incarnate as a descendant of David. This word became a man of the lineage of David and dwelt among us. But he did not change, becoming flesh, but he clothed himself with flesh to manifest himself in the proper way to carnal men, close quote. To ensure that people knew that Christ's descent from David did not denote his ontological genesis as merely human, Augustine emphasizes that Paul's phrase, according to the flesh, means that the Son of God was not created by God, but rather his human nature was born. Conversely, when Paul speaks of Christ being predestinated with the power of the Son of God, according to the Spirit, it reveals the Son's divinity. The fact of having died makes reference to being the Son of David. On the other hand, the resurrection from the divet, the, is quoting Augustine here, reference refers to his divine filiation being also the Lord of David himself. That's a good point, 2 Corinthians 13, 4. Augustine zeroes in on the specific meaning of Paul's statement. Why does he say that Christ was predestined to be the Son of God if he was already the Son? Augustine explains. He was actually predestined to be the Son of God with a certain primacy in the resurrection. Since his predestination was from the resurrection of the dead, that is, he was destined to rise above others and before others. The words Son of God placed before it was predestined are like the confirmation of such high dignity. Only the Son of God could be predestined to this, since he is also the head of the church, <clears throat> and the same apostle in another place calls him the firstborn from the dead. It was convenient that the judge of the resurrected was the one who had preceded them as model, but not as a model of all resurrected one, ones, but as an example of those who have to resuscitate to live and reign eternally. Augustine does not restrict Romans 1.4 <clears throat> to the confirmation of the Son's deity and appointment as the head of the church, but also notes that according to the spirit of sanctification by resurrection from the dead, means that after Christ's resurrection, believers received the gift of the Spirit. How so? Anyone in union with, with Christ receives the Spirit. And he will turn next to Thomas Aquinas, which we'll pick up in another edition. And now, should I let that subscription lapse? Postmodernistic approaches to confessions. 
postmodernism is quite hard on not only the truthfulness of the scriptures, but also especially on the truthfulness of a confessional standard like the Lutheran confessions. Postmodernism presumes that truth is personal, that it cannot be carried by words and texts. There is no identifiable authorial intention. Texts have no objective basis, but are radically your own. It's relativism. You are free to make any construction from them that you desire. The book will always agree with you because you tell the book, the Bible, the confessions, what it means. The possibility that the book tells me what I should mean is out of bounds. Of course, this makes confessional subscription impossible by definition because you'd be subscribing to your own opinion regardless of the content of the confessions. I hope that this is not what young people steeped in postmodern truth mean when they subscribe to Lutheran confessions. Another approach, historicistic, this would be Bart's contention against the Orthodox Reformed Communion. Confessional subscription is not a time-bound 16th century doctrinal straitjacket that ought to be junked in favor of unbounded Christian freedom. The formula of Concord subscribed more than 40 years after the presentation of the Augsburg Confession, pledged to a faithful confession of the Augsburg Confession, not because it was written by theologians. We got some footnotes. The effort, oh, this is wonderful. The effort to read books as their writers intended them to be read has been made into a crime ever since the intentional fallacy was instituted. Alan Bloom, the closing of the American mind. Another footnote, there is an enormous difference between saying, as teachers once said, you must learn to see the world as Homer and Shakespeare Shakespeare did, and saying, as teachers do now, Homer and Shakespeare had some of the same concerns you do and can enrich your vision of the world. In the former approach, students are challenged to discover new experiences and reassess old. In the latter, they are free to use books in any way they please. A teacher who treated the Bible naively, taking it at its word or word, would be accused of scientific incompetence and lack of sophistication. Bloom, the closing of the American mind. Footnote 24, the postmodern rejection of objective truth is based on an internal contradiction. The only truth is that there is no truth which is not true. Uh, Formula of Concord, I believe here. We do so not because the Augsburg Confession was produced by our theologians, but because it is taken from God's word and is firmly and soundly grounded in it. We'll pick this up again as we turn to Journal of Theological Studies discussing Cephas and Christ on this rock that will build my church. A fourth explanation may be hazarded. It is one which would be more acceptable in the first than in the 20th century of our era. Six journey, six days journey off, there was a mountain of transfiguration for a caravan to reach it and to reach the side whence it could be climbed may well have called for devious wanderings. Perhaps it was not even the objective consequent march. In any case, it does not seem to be incredible that this rock was the peak of this mountain near and far enough to impress the spectator with a sense of obvious sanctity. 
Gerizim or Zion or Mount Tabor, one of the everlasting hills, is the fit site for the worship of Jehovah. There on the summit, guarded on this side by spurs and screes and scars, the chosen witness of this transient glory may well have thought that Jesus began to rebuild his immaterial church. But this church whose service shall be rational and spiritual can hardly be built upon a rock of creation. If Jesus is speaking and speaking for himself, this rock must be Jehovah. If Jehovah be speaking through his mouthpiece, Jesus, the Christ, must be the rock. And he's made a point earlier that we don't know what Jesus pointed at or looked at. Of course, the Romanists claim that Peter was the foundation of the church, which Peter rejects and denies when he says Christ is the rock and foundation stone. Augustine, a Daniel come to judgment, is able to identify builder and foundation. But his interpretation has merits which are independent of this confusion of thought. This rock, my church, and the introductory formula, and moreover to thee I say, unite to plead against the infallibility and impeccability of the received Greek text. This rock in my church suggests that the real speaker must be Jehovah through Jesus, his interpreter. After all, this is only translation Greek, and here may stand for but and connect contrasted things. A little bit of wonkiness here. In such a case, the second thing is rightly contested for the sake of requisite emphasis. It is as if one would say, thou art Petros, but on this Petros, on the true Petra, God, Jehovah, will I build my church. Other foundation can no man lay, save that which is in Christ Jesus. To whom approaching a living stone by men rejected, but with God, elect, precious, ye also as living stones, said St. Peter, are being built a spiritual house into a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. We'll pick that up later. Very nice little piece of work on Matthew 16. We turn to a new article in the Protestant Reformed Theological Journal, The Perfectly Simple Triune Covenant God by Marco Barone. Introduction. In the Protestant world, the classical doctrine of God, his one being, three persons and attributes, is often addressed with the phrase classical Christian theism. He's going to quote James Dolezal, all that is in God, evangelical theology and the challenge of Christian theism. For the church father Augustine, see God in patristic thought, J.N.D. Kelly, early Christian doctrine, fifth edition. That's a go-to volume. The approach of classical Christian theism is what one discovers in the older Protestant confessions as the Belgic Confession, the 39 Articles of Religion, Westminster Confession of Faith, and Second London Confession of Faith. The approach is basically in keeping with the view of God as found in the works of patristic and medieval Christian theologians such as Athanasius, Augustine, Anselm, and Aquinas. It is marked by a strong commitment to the doctrines of divine aseity, simplicity, eternity, immutability, impassibility, and the substantial unity of the divine persons. The underlying and inviolable conviction is that God does not derive any aspect of his being from outside himself and is in, not in any way caused to be. 
Classical Christian theism, as defined above, finds vocal supporters among the Reformed, Lutherans, Arminians, and Roman Catholics. We'll pick that up again, and we are in Thamelius and the reversal theme of 1 Samuel 2 and Esther. Wonderful article. Absolutely marvelous. The King's Gate, that would be Ahasuerus, was often a place where officials gathered and illegal matters were discussed. In Esther, Mordecai's place at the gate probably serves a mediatorial purpose. On the one hand, Mordecai serves as a representative of his people, as demonstrated by his mournful sitting in sackcloth and ashes at the King's Gate. On the other hand, and it's going to be a reversal theme, Haman, who's up here, comes down, and Mordecai, who's down here, goes up. And on the other hand, it's also a place where Mordecai actively blesses the city in which he lives, Jeremiah 29.7. For example, it is at the city gate that Mordecai overhears the plot to assassinate the king and works to prevent it. Thus, it is at the city gate that Mordecai advocates for his people, but he also honors the king. In this way, even while being poor in Persia, Mordecai serves as a prince among his people. While many scholars highlight the seemingly apparent assimilation of the Jewish characters in Esther, there's plenty of evidence that Mordecai was a faithful Jew living in exile. To be sure, his name may not be Persian. However, his actions prove that he is anything but Persian. The conflict with Haman is initiated because Mordecai, as a Jew, refuses to bow to Haman. While some scholars have argued that Mordecai's motive was jealousy, there's no evidence of such in the text. After the king's question, after the king's servants question Mordecai's refusal, they indicate that the primary reason Mordecai had given for not bowing was that he was a Jew. 3 verse 4. In Esther, Mordecai takes on a truly heroic role, advising Hadassah uncovering an assassination plot, refusing to tremble before Haman, leading the Jews in crying out and fasting, petitioning Queen Esther's assistance, and eventually being exalted to a princely place in the king's court. The theory that Esther records God's faithfulness despite the unfaithful and unrepentant Jews in Persia simply does not hold when considering Mordecai's humble work on his people's behalf. In Esther 4, Mordecai takes on the role of the poor. By the way, we're reading Esther in Hebrew day by day. We're up to 6-3, I think it is. And he's uncovered the plot of two attendants in the court, the plot to assassinate the king takes on the role of the poor seated in the dust up far, mentioned in 1 Samuel 2.7. I think his connectivity of 1 Samuel 2 and Esther is a little bit strained. Yes, there's a thematic assonance or the, uh, thematic congruence, but I'm not sure I want to connect it back to the book of 1 Samuel. When Mordecai learned all that had been done, Mordecai tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes for one. Ape fair, ape fair. With him, many of the Jews also wore sackcloth and laid in ashes. The mention of ashes or dust corresponds with the similar, though distinct, down far found in 1 Samuel 2.8, which also means dust. Though these two lexical forms are not a one-to-one -one correspondence, it's not difficult to imagine 
an at least conceptual parallel between the poor who sit in up fair with the Jews who sit in up fair afar, both of which denounce abject humiliation. In Old Testament symbolism, dressing in sackcloth and ashes signifies mourning and suffering. However, it can also emphasize weakness and emptiness. In this way, the Jews sitting in the ashes dust is a self-humiliation that expresses the seriousness of their plight. With the helpless lying in dust and ashes, the stage is now set forth for the great reversal. According to Hannah's reversal psalm in 1 Samuel 2, Haman is destined to be brought low, while those who sit in the dust, dust like Mordecai, will be raised up from the ash heap. Pick that up next time. As we turn to the story on the Christian Education Committee and the Timothy Conferences, which are held for nominees, nominee, young nominees, ages 16 to 21, nominated by their sessions to attend this conference on seminary education. It involves about 20 to 30 young men potentially preparing for ministry. Reflections and thanksgivings, this is after the conference. They didn't have one during the COVID period. The group then departed for dinner and fellowship at the home of Gabriel and Aaron Nave, members of Harvest OPC in San Marcos, California. In addition to many conversations around the Nave's patio, the rousing game of runaround with Dr. A. Troxel at the ping pong table also broke out. The night ended with prayer and thanksgivings to God for the events of the past two days and for God's blessing on the participants. Early Saturday morning, the first car started to leave for the San Diego airport. Mr. Fick said, I was once again, I once again boarded the plane for home with thankfulness in my heart to the Lord for blessing our labors and praying that he would raise up from among these young men the next generation of faithful pastors for the OPC. Dr. Van Drunen added, we had a great group of young men who expressed serious interest in service to Christ and his church and who also developed quick rapport with one another. Attendee Evan Wheat echoed Van Drunen's comments on fellowship. On my trip to and from Escondido, I missed a flight, had a flight canceled, and had a nap on the ground of the Phoenix airport. But I would experience all these troubles again in a heartbeat if it meant being able to spend more time with the brothers I found at the Timothy conference. A wonderful story. Um, Congratulations, Children's Catechism has been recited by Heidi Selby of Calvary OPC, Middletown, PA. And then it's got a, another note, Favorite Psalms and Hymns, the Trinity Psalter, number 131A, My Heart is Not Exalted, by John Muther. Like many OPC congregations, our church has grown in greater familiarity with and deepening love for the Psalms since we acquired this Trinity Psalter hymnal in 2018. One select selection that has quickly become a favorite is Psalm 131a. Though 131b is more familiar, 131a is a beautiful tune that originated as a 16th century German Christmas carol. Lob, lob goat, in Christa alle gleich, praise God, all Christians equally, by Nicholas Hermann, an early Protestant hymn writer and contemporary of Martin Luther. 
two centuries later, Johann Sebastian Bach developed the harmony. The Songs of Ascent, Psalms of Ascent, Psalm 130 to 134, describe the dangers, toils, and snares in our journey to Zion. Bandits and thieves, sunstroke and moonstroke, wild animals and other threats. In Psalm 131, we find yet another challenge in our pilgrimage, our pride and prosperity. This brief psalm teaches a lesson about contentment. It begins with the counter-cultural call to restrain personal ambition. David describes this by means of a dysfunctional body part, a haughty heart, and prideful eyes. In modern parlance, the pilgrim is blessed who stays in his lane, not occupying himself with things too high. Rather than peer into the secret things of God, we must hope, rest, and trust in what is revealed to us in his word. David goes on to liken contentment to a weaned child, calmed and stilled, who continues to enjoy the nearness and intimacy of his mother. The infant has matured into a childlike faith. Psalm 131 is a humble psalm about humility, and Charles Spurgeon once observed that it is one of the shortest psalms to read, but one of the longest psalms to learn. We can add that it is one of the loveliest psalms to sing. And then out of the mouth. My son Ray was recently giggling to himself and singing what sounded like standing in the need of prayer. However, the pastor who had taught him the hymn was balding, and Ray had misheard the words. He was singing standing in the need of hair. <laughs> we'll pick this up another article next time. While we're in this peculiar journal, Journal of Biblical and Theological Studies on the Study of Catholicity in Credo Un. Um, Ecclesia, I believe in one Catholic church. This is written from several different, it's 260 pages, different faith traditions and how they view Catholicity. And the first one up is Professor Echeverria, a Roman Catholic professor of New Testament. I'm getting a little wonky here, but he's brought in Burkauer. The extraordinary unity of the church is not a human construction, but a divine reality received as a gift. This is why Ratzinger can say, and Burkauer and Casper agree, the true church is reality, an existing reality, even now. In sum, in capital C, Catholic ecclesiology holds that the one true church of Jesus Christ subsists in the Catholic Church on the one hand and the plurality of churches on the other. The Catholic Church dares and must dare to take the paradoxical position of attributing to herself in a unique way the singular form, the Church, concludes Ratzinger, despite that in the midst of the plurality she has accepted Put differently, it's about Catholicity in a concrete form. The church is a concrete dum universale, as I explained earlier. This constitutive feature of Catholic, capital C, ecclesial identity, as correctly underscored by Casper, does not imply that others outside the church are not Christian, or, adds Ratzinger, dispute the fact that their communities have an ecclesial character. Briefly, in this connection, here is the dilemma that Catholic ecclesiology seeks to av avoid either, it's going to be an either-or construct, either correctly affirming that the Church of Christ fully and totally subsists alone in its own right 
faith in the Catholic Church because the entire fullness of the means of salvation and of unity, which is not found in any other church, is present in her, and then implausibly denying that orthodoxy and historic churches of the Reformation are churches in any real sense whatsoever, such that there exists an ecclesia, ecclesial wasteland or emptiness outside the church's visible boundaries or rightly affirming that there are churches in some sense in a lesser or greater degree to the extent that ecclesial elements of truth and sanctification exist in them but then wrongly accepting ecclesiological relativism or pluralism meaning thereby that the one church, true church of christ subsists in many churches with which the Catholic Church being merely one among many churches. Okay, try to pull the thread on that one and see where it goes. We turn to Reformed Presbyterian Theological Journal and its rather straightforward exposition of Romans 8, 1 to 4. We pick up there, the Apostles' doctrine is equally opposed to the antinomian scheme which asserts the believer's freedom from the law as a rule of life therefore he adds in the end of the fourth verse of romans 8 who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit this language is descriptive of those in whom the righteousness of the law is fulfilled it shows that they are the same persons described in the first verse as in Christ. For they submit to the same direction and are led by the same God, guide. It also evinces the righteousness by which the law is fulfilled to be the righteousness of Christ, received by faith and imputed to those who embrace it. Contrary to the explanation sometimes given of this passage, that holiness produced by the sanctifying operations of the Spirit is intended. This is never called the righteousness of the law, nor do we by it obtain freedom from condemnation. Justification in the order of nature precedes sanctification, is an act completed at once in history, and applies the fulfillment of the righteousness of the law in the person justified. The whole doctrine of this passage is fraught with encouragement and consolation to believers in Christ. The mystical union between him and them is indissoluble. There's the reformed view. He is their living head. They are members of his body. Justified freely by his righteousness, the sentence of condemnation is removed, no more to have place against them. Sin is condemned. It can no longer have dominion over them. They are not under the law as a covenant of works. It is righteousness fulfilled in them. Made alive by the law of the spirit of life, they are led by and walk after him, not after the flesh. To the land of uprightness, he will conduct them. To be ever with the Son of God, who is in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, but is now in that same flesh glorified. Their body shall be light, made like to his glorious body. Freed from sin and perfected in holiness, they shall unremittingly praise the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for the love manifested in the economy and accomplishment of that redemption, which brings glory to God and everlasting salvation to those who through it are freed from condemnation. Oh my, we, that brings an end to that article. We shift to um, an article by Gregory Beale in the Southwest Theological Journal. 
an art, an edition dedicated to ex dealing with the use of the Old Testament and the new. Dr. Gregory Beale, this is Reform Faith and Practice. No, it's not Southwest Journal. But Dr. Beale is a professor at Reform Theological Seminary. I want to say Jackson, but it may be Orlando. He's looking at the use of the Old Testament in the Book of Revelation. This is one of his specialties. The evaluation of Daniel as very influential is supported by focused study. Among the allusions to Daniel, the greatest number are from Daniel 7. In terms of actual allusions, Isaiah is first, followed by Ezekiel, Daniel, and Psalms, though statistics differ. There's more agreement that Ezekiel exerts greater influence in Revelation than Daniel. The Old Testament in general plays a major role that a proper understanding of its use is necessary for the understanding of Revelation as a whole. And I lean kind of heavily to Dr. Beale as a go-to man on Revelation. The text form of the Old Testament references in Revelation needs in-depth discussion. Since there are no formal quotations and most are allusions, a phenomena often making identification of such references more difficult. The complex relation of the Hebrew text to the Greek versions, the history of which is largely unknown to us, makes it difficult to know whether John depends on the Hebrew or Greek. Unfortunately, however, the scope of the present discussion precludes thorough analysis of this important subject. The majority of commentators have not followed Sweet's assessment that John depended mainly on the Septuagint and have apparently followed Charles' conclusion that John was influenced more by the Hebrew than the Greek Old Testament, a conclusion based mainly on the observation that John's allusions depart from the words of the Septuagint. And we'll pick that up again. Clear illusion, probable illusion, etc. Now, for Princeton Theological Journal, this is discussing the rights, constitutional rights of the General Assembly to establish a foreign board of mission. Kind of a wonky in house debate of 1837 far removed from the demise and decline, the decadence, the doctrinal incoherence of the modern Presbyterian church whence this scribe comes. Judge Stevens, he's talking about an 1836 General Assembly in the debate, however, was the gentleman who expended most argument in defense of this position from his high respectability and from his legal attainments, more importance was attached to his opinion. The previous question had actually been moved, but as we learn from the evangelist on the earnest entreaty of Dr. Skinner that Judge Stevens might have an opportunity to speak, it was withdrawn. We attach importance to this speech, not only from the circumstances just stated, but also from the consideration that it was an answer to a formal argument by Dr. Hodge to prove the right of the assembly to conduct missionary operations. The judge remarked that he wished to speak to the constitutional question on which his professional pursuits had suggested a few thoughts that might be worthy of consideration. The question of constitutional authority is in its very nature a technical one. The sweeping argument of the brother, Dr. Hodge, who spoke last, finds its source in his own good feelings and his zeal to have every body engaged in missionary cause and not in the constitution of the church. He says it is the duty of the church to carry on missions. 
Nobody doubts that it is the duty of the Catholic visible church to spread the gospel throughout the earth. But that is nothing to the point to prove that this body has the power to appoint a board of missions. The Catholic visible church, it is truly said, is not an organized body. That's kind of weird. What else is it? A disorganized body? is composed of individuals, and the duty of the church is the duty of all individuals who compose it. And they are to promote missions and extend the gospel in the best way they can. I told you it was wonky. How does this go to prove the General Assembly has authority to conduct and regulate missionary efforts that are to be made by members of the Presbyterian Church? The question of authority is to be proved, not assumed. If it exists in the General Assembly, it has been given by the churches. So authority of the General Assembly is that of the churches and then the presbyteries. The whole authority is, as I understand, our con Constitution remains in the sessions and presbyteries. Hence, when any new authority is proposed to be exercised by this body, it is necessary to send down a question to the presbyteries for their consent. It is said we subvert the authority of the Board of Missions. Suppose we do. The precedent is nothing in the face of the Constitution. It is to be presumed that it was an act of inadvertence that the minds of the Assembly or not distinctly turn to the question of constitutional power rather than to suppose that they establish the Board of Missions. It is a bad argument from one breach of the Constitution to plead in favor of another. I believe we have no authority until the Presbyteries give it. And we'll bring this article to a close in this marathon session of theological journals. If the Lord be for us, who can be against us? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God who justifies. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Godspeed.